wonderful and precious chance for me to be your MC in this beautiful day on Thursday, 21st September 2023, in our first guest lecture of Master of Biomedical Science, ERC University. First of all, let's say thanks to Allah who has been giving us guidance, happiness, healthy, and mercy so we can attend and participate in this event without any obstacles. Praise and salutation upon our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, who has guided us from the darkness to the lightness, from Jahiliya era to Islamic era. In this beautiful moment, I would like to say thank you to the director of Postgraduate School DRC University, Professor Chandra Yogaritama, and to the head of uh, Master Program of Biomedical Science, Dr. Daru Andri Damayanti, and Secretary of Master Program of Biomedical Science, Dr. Juniati, for organizing this event. Many thanks to Professor Sutana Farad, Coordinator of Master Program on Genetic Counseling for organizing and inviting our main guest today. And big welcome to Professor Gerard Muko. Bonjour. So actually, actually, we have different time zone with France. So good morning, Prof. And thank you for your precious time to be in this event. And lastly, thank you to all participants who joined our first guest lecture today. All right. So wait, I will share a bit uh, the PowerPoint. Okay, all right. To begin, uh, let's ask here the opening speech uh, from our director of postgraduate school. Please welcome Professor Chandra Yoga Aritama. Yeah, yeah, I'm still muted. Sorry, I got it now. Maaf, Prof. Masih so, good afternoon, uh, colleague, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Prof. Mauco. Mauco. I'm sorry. So, uh, 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 very glad that we, we can meet uh, this uh, today, uh, morning or, or afternoon, to discuss a very important topic. Uh, I just would like to mention three things. Number one, uh, I think maybe colleagues already knows that last, last, last month or about two months ago, WHO sending a call for expert for technical advisory group on genomics. Uh, I, I was I was contacted by a colleague from other country uh, asking my 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 suggestion to them. So uh, I think that, uh, now it's already announced. I do not know who is the member, but what important thing is why why WHO making this a uh, uh, technical advisory group on genom uh, on genomics because Dr. Tedros the, the DG. Uh, I think two or three years ago, established a science council to advise him on the scientific agenda. And one of the report published was about the uh, accelerating access to genomic for global health. Uh, and there are several recommendations, but I just put it into four categories that it's, it is mentioned in the WHO website. So four categories in this uh, genomic in general, I'm not talking about the, the one that we will discuss today, but in general, the first one is talking about promotion. Oh, uh, promotion of genomics through advocacy. Number two is about implementation of genomics, which, which I think we will discuss today. Number three is about the collaboration among scientists and en engaging in genomics. So because it's not only uh, biomedical people. And number four, the, the, the last one, but it's also very important, is talking about the attention to ethical, legal, and social issues of this uh, 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 genomic issue, uh, which, which are very very, uh, I, I, I should say very popular now because of the COVID-19, but it's very important advance in, in, uh, in, in the health field. So that's my, my, my first point that I would like to raise. I know this is not really directly, directly uh, uh, linked with, with the discussion because discussion already very, very, very technical. I saw the, the topic is some aspect of gene expression and linked to epigenetic uh, code even me, I, I'm not sure I understand, uh, really understand what this one, but this is, this is the... <laughs> so that's the first thing I would like to mention. Second thing, of course, uh, th thank you very much, Prof. Moko, for your uh, time to attend uh, our first meeting between you and Jakarta. I do not know whether you have been in Jakarta or Indonesia. Or, oh, okay. Quite okay. often. Quite so, often. Maybe, yeah. so, so at least we can, we, we can meet uh, 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 virtually. So thank you, Prof. Sultana to, to facilitate this 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 uh, 
this event. Uh, but I saw Professor Marco some of background in your place is something like like traditional. I don't know whether it is European or some something like Japanese uh, 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 desk as well. But anyway, so once again, thank you, Prof. Marco, for your time and and I do hope that uh, this is this is this is the first, but this is not the last uh, communication between you and us. Uh, so. Uh, as already mentioned, we just opened our new, uh, what call it, cancer ge genetic uh, 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 st uh, study here. I mean, not study, course or whatever the name is. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure Prof. Sultan already talked to you about that one. And hopefully that we can, we can you know, uh, collaborate with, uh, further in, a, in the future time. I'm, I'm trying to read uh, Nabila, and he, she knows the France, but I, I'm trying to, to read the name of your university. So, I'm so, very sorry for my friends, Université de Poitia, something like that. So, in okay, okay. So, so that's that's uh, so looking forward for further collaboration, Prof. So, my, my, my third point, I just would like to thank uh, 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 my colleague from the biomedical department, Bu Ndaru, Bu Pi, Bu Nabila, of course, Prof. Sultana, and all of the colleagues who attend this uh, important discussion, this webinar. Uh, uh, this is already 3, 3, 3 p.m. here in, in Jakarta, but um, the topic is very, very, very not only relevant, but this is all re we need for not only advancement of science and technology, but really how to implement in our daily life. So by those three, uh, once again, thank you very much, colleagues, let, let, ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's, uh, uh, we have a very, very fruitful and very useful uh, webinar uh, today. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, great. Thank Terima you. Terima kasih, Chandra. All right, uh, let's uh, we move on to the next session. Uh, okay. So, wait a moment. All right. So in this part, uh, I will introduce a uh, little bit our moderator today, our lovely Professor Dr. Sultana Faraz. So she is a professor of medical genetics at Faculty of Medicine, Diponegoro University, Indonesia. She has been trained on medical genetics in Japan, Australia, Netherlands, USA, and Canada. She obtained her PhD on medical genetics at the University of New South Wales, Australia during which she did her course on clinical genetics at Sydney Children's Hospital. And she awarded Australian alumni finalist in research and innovation from Australian mm -hmm. University mm -hmm. and best researcher in medicine from Bakri Foundation. <laughs> she established the first master program on genetic counseling in 2006 at Diponegoro University and reactivated Indonesian Society of Human Genetics in 2016 runs genetics counseling clinic at some hospital. And she is now teaching at postgraduate school, ERC University, especially as coordinator of master program on genetic counseling. Not only that, she is a member of Indonesian Academy of Science and other genetic society in Asia, America, and Australia. And she is a president of Indonesian Society of Genetic Counselor. Her research interests on intellectual disability and disorders of sex differentiation with published paper more than 100 at peer review journal with H index Scopus 21. All right. Uh, and then uh, here our main star today who will give us the previous lecture, Professor Gerhard uh, Muko. Bonjour. Comment allez-vous? Comment allez-vous? Bien. Yeah, Vous it's aussi, a... votre famille, oui, oui, c'est bien. Et madame. Oui, c'est bien. So, oui. actually, I have known him from uh, six years ago during my doctoral study. So, merci beaucoup, Prof. Mouko. Bienvenue sur, sur notre Zoom. On est ravis de vous voir aujourd'hui. We are happy to see you today. So, let me read a short introduction about, uh, about you. So he was uh, the head of biochemistry department in University Hospital Center of Poitiers. He was an artistic director uh, in an amateur choir and orchestra as his uh, extra professional experience. And he was a former vice president in charge of uh, doctoral studies at 
comme oui. l'université confédérale Léonard de Vinci, c'est un consortium de quatre universités et deux ingénieur schools. And he was a former vice president in charge of research at University Hospital Center of Poitiers. And also he was a former professor emeritus in Université de Poitiers. Well, before we begin, for all participants, uh, there will be a Q&A session after the lecture. So if you want to ask, di ask directly to Prof. Muko, you can click the right hand icon on your Zoom, or you can type uh, your question on the chat room. And maybe Prof. Muko will give a break in the middle of uh, the lecture, so you can uh, use uh, the break uh, for asking question. All right, uh, without further ado, I will pass to Prof. Sultana to continue for the next session. So please, Prof. Sultana. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, especially for Professor Moko and good afternoon for everyone. Yeah, today we have a first lecture of uh, our starting study of uh, as a master program, and we so happy to have Professor Moko with and. He has give his generous time for us. Yeah, and the topic is uh, very important, especially for the program with genetic counseling. Yeah, because this is a bi basic knowledge, especially this time, because many diseases also caused by uh, epigenetic influence. So let hear uh, his uh, talk about uh, epigenetic and also the uh, influence to the disease or uh, gene expression. Prof. Moko, time is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Salamat sore. Um, I asked Google Translate to say something. So, saya sangat senang visa bersamaanda hari ini. And then in Ijuga Sua Tuke Homotan. Then do Saya Baya Saya Lebi Suka Berada di Jakarta. Too far away. Okay, maybe it was totally incompressible. It was Google Translate is read by a Frenchman. Okay, thanks so much, um, Prof. Sultana and colleagues, to inviting me, as I tried to say in Indonesia. In Mbahaza, it, it was really a, well, first a surprise because I'm retired, fully retired. And um, uh, I cannot say no to any of the questions Prof. Sultana and Prof. Hussein uh, asked to me and said, yes, of course, I will try to do something. And then I realized that I will try to do something, but I was not the expert on this thing, and I had to, le to learn a lot of things, and this was absolutely fascinating. The, path, the first part will be very basic um, aspects of gene transcription and regulation, and uh, then also on gene translation into uh, proteins. Let's start. Recording, please. Mundaru, recording, please. Oh, ada yeah, Prof, segera di record. Masih aja, oh, yeah, tolong ya. You, you can record it, of course. And I will send uh, the, the PowerPoint to uh, Ibu uh, Nabila. Is it okay with this? Okay, Prof. Okay, so now I, I'm not in Poitiers anymore. Poitiers is here in the center of France. And um, we had a good university there. But of course, when I retired, I followed my wife. She followed me all her life to different places. So we are now in Bayonne, which is 
here, just here, this is the border between Spain and France. Germany is here, Italy is here, Netherlands there, and somewhere here is Portugal, <laughs> just for Port Sultana. So this is the city. You can see it is not a big city. It is a very old city with very old houses, a, a church, of course, and uh, fences of stone, which are now with uh, full of uh, trees. And these are two rivers that will go to the ocean. You can see maybe in the far, um, in the far. So we have old houses, of course, high rise houses for stairs. We have very many places to of meeting, of um, discussing, of uh, having a dinner. We have a very hard culture, which is the Basque culture. And it is in France, one of the most important uh, old culture preserved. Of course, we play rugby and uh, rugby is a very special game. The ball is not on, it's very difficult. We have a harbor, an industrial harbor and this is it. So in here we play music, a lot of music. We play golf, a lot of golf. We hike, some hiking, and we read things about science. I read things about science. And let's start now about this. So as you know, just because Prof. Sultana said, or oh, make it, it, it simple at the beginning, um, DNA, the nucleic acid is tightly packed in cells. And this is seen as dark bound, bands in karyotypes. However, some low zones are less packed. It is not well known why this. This is due to the gym cell staining and this is the G chromosome banding of an idealized human karyotype. You see all the pairs here, which have been sorted by nucleolus position. And in here, you see the difference between men, only one tiny Y chromosome, and women, two large X chromosomes. This will have many implications we will talk about at the very end of the talk. From now on, we will use a very simplified model, the double strand of DNA molecule. What the topic is today is gene expression at large. And this is, this is the simplest way to talk about gene expression and to say that DNA here can go and make RNA here. And this leads to translation into proteins. For that, you have the first process, which is transcription on DNA to RNA, a fairly complicated affair. And then RNA is translated into proteins. For the sake of well, universality, they put here reverse transcription. This has been a concern with few events uh, in the last years, especially with uh, mRNA vaccines. But in humans, reverse transcription is extremely poorly active, extremely scarce, and it's very specific to uh, the, um, something which is not well known. Um, so we will not talk of this today. It is of no importance for this topic. But this chain, DNA to RNA to protein, of course, everybody knows in the room. This can be refined. And um, I like uh, bi cellular biology. So in here, I found this uh, cartoon saying that the double-stranded DNA will be transcribed into messenger RNA inside the, nuclear, the nucleus. There are several other RNAs we will not take talk today. And then once the mRNA is 
ready, it will exit via the nuclear pore and encounter ribosomes, which are huge protein and RNA of different types. Uh, machine key, which translate the information coded by the messenger RNA into proteins. Amino acids are linked to one another, one at a time, to form the protein which has to be produced. Of course, this can be also more refined, including other subcellular organelles. We see the nucleus and the exit of the RNA to the cytosol. It is not really true in eukaryotic um, cells. And um, indeed, there are organelles around the nucleus in close relationship with the nuclear pores. And this is the endoplasmic reticulum. These things here are endoplasmic reticulum. And you can see dotted areas. And these dots are the ribosomes. And then you see also a part of the endoplasmic reticulum, which does not have any ribosome on it. It is so called smooth. The other one is rough because it appears like if you had a some kind of grains on the membrane. And then this uh, uh, rough and the plasmic reticulum will be the lo locus where the um, protein is, is, is synthesized. Usually proteins are not re re released in directly into the cytosol, but more often they are transported by vesicles to another multilamellar apparatus, which is the Golgi apparatus. And then this is the final um, sorting of the directions of the protein. It can be secreted via a vesicle from the Golgi, who will fuse with a plasma membrane and then the, uh, soluble, soluble uh, proteins will leave or can be stocked in vacuoles or lysosomes or even incorporated in, directly into the plasma membrane. So there are many uh, possibilities, but of course it is gene and protein and species specific. Um, to make it clear, today we will speak only on eukaryotes and not on prokaryotes. That makes some kind of a difference. The, the process is, the overall process is the same. However, the details are not the same and the regulations are by far different. Some reminders, of course, you see here the double-stranded DNA, the chromosome, and I'm expanding in here. And for instance, these two very different proteins have been synthesized via, via the sequence transcription, translation, and after that, maturation of the proteins. And you can see that in here you have alpha helix, in here you have beta plates, beta sheets, and alpha helix, and so on. So you can have anything, but this is nothing to do with the transcription and translation. It, is, it has to do with the properties of the proteins themselves once they have been produced. What? Well, just to be sure everybody in the room has the same knowledge. I don't know uh, who are the attendees to this and who are the students? Of course, I'm sorry for ones who know this, of course, and teach this. Well, what makes up the chemical structure of DNA? DNA, which is the place where the genes are. It's quite a complicated structure. Now it's simple because we know it for 50 years, at least. Watson and Crick 
at the end of the 50s. And then it is based on, uh, on links made by sugar phosphate backbone and also uh, nitrogen bases here, which can be adenine, uh, timine, cytosine, and so on. Here they are. And then this pairs to a specific, uh, for instance, A, T will, A will always pair with a T on the other stand, and G will always pair to a C in the other stand. It's not random. It is very specific. It is linked by uh, hydrogen bonds. Here, two hydrogen bonds if you have an A and a T, and in here, four, three hydrogen bonds if it is a G, which is linked in the C. So this is one strand of the uh, DNA, and this is the other strand. In such a way that these two strands are complementary to each other. When we uh, go from DNA to uh, RNA, one of these strands is copy, copied, copied, yes, into a mRNA sequence, and we'll see this a little bit later. The system is exactly the same. You always have this links before the RNA is, is uh, freed. The only difference is that when you have a T on DNA, you will have an U on uh, mRNA. So this is the only difference, otherwise the complementary thing is the same. And the second difference is in here, you have deoxyribose, no hydroxy here, in the ribonucleotides RNA, you will have a ribose, which is some kind of a difference also. So this is the general scheme of the structure of the DNA, and then the sequence from DNA to make of the uh, RNA. And also the RNA is made of triplets. We will see it later. And each triplet is specific for a protein. There are more triplets than amino acid, uh, an amino acid is a protein. There are more triplets than amino acids, but in any case, this is something which is very, very conserved. Uh, it's all over a universal. So the difference to be to summarize it up is DNA is double standard, desoxy ribose, two strands in double X conformation. It stores genetic information. It is the only place in the body, in the cells, in all uh, the uh, eukaryotes where the genetic information is conserved, and it is inside the nucleus. RNA is, well, seems to be only one strand of uh, DNA. And in fact, it's always one strand which can be um, uh, folded uh, with little parts of double strand. We see it later. It's built, it will be the template for building proteins according to the genetic information which has been stored in the DNA. RNA are very, very short-lived um, molecules. They do not stay for long in the cytoplasm or on the Golgi because they are really prone to degradation. Salam. I'm sorry. Mohon speakernya okay. ditutup kalau masih ngobrol ya. Just Any one question? of the participant. No, no, just one of the participants. Ah, okay, the okay. Well, and then shut off his, his um, microphone. Okay, good. <laughs> so the genetic information is here. In eukaryotes, this is only an imprint 
short-lived imprint of uh, the uh, genetic information. In prokaryotes, especially in viruses, you have viruses who rely on RNA, these are the riboviruses, and many diseases are due to these things. Um, well, nothing we can do a bit about. So the general scheme, which is the kind of, uh, not a dogma, because in science we don't have dogmas, but uh, the actual, hmm, 10 years ago, actual state of the art is that the double-stranded DNA will be transcribed into RNA, so you can see it here. RNA copy is one strand, a copy of one strand of the double-stranded DNA, and then the translation will add the things, the amino acids. At, at the end, we have an amino acid sequence, that's it, a protein. Transcription is done at a specific place where DNA is melted. That means that those two strands are not linked together anymore. For a specific gene, one is called coding strand, uh, strand and the other one is template strand. It does not mean that always the template strand is the same for all the genes. Can be a gene on this one in here, but on this one can be a gene elsewhere. And then this coding strand for this peculiar gene will be the template because it is not specific to one or the other. There are no specificity of a coding and template as the coding for all the genes genes and template for all the genes. This is true only for one gene. And the main polyprotein enzyme is called RNA polymerase, which is in case, case one. Where, but when, when you have this huge, um, DNA with thousands or ten of thousands of uh, nucleotides. Where I, do I start to transcribe the DNA into the pertinent um, RNA? I cannot do all the thing. Uh, it is worthless, otherwise. Uh, we have all the genes and, and then I cannot say where I started and I do not want to produce all the genes as the same. So where to start? It is a very, very complicated thing. I cannot tell you all the details. I took a summary uh, slide in somewhere, I don't know where. And uh, you see, you see things TF2, D, T, B, P, TF2, A, uh, TF2, B, uh, well, transcription, transcription factors are many. And all these transcription factors will lead to recruit the RNA pol polymerase 2, which is the one we see in, uh, in eukaryotes. And this will be the molecular complex who will start the transcription. But where do we start? We start in a place which is called the Tata box. You see here that the Tata box is a region not that long with T and A and mostly A. So this is the place to be, and uh, uh, several transcription factors bind to it. For instance, here, these two, then they recruit two other ones. And um, this binds to the multi-complex and starts to work. So it is a sort of a signal 
Start here, please. Start here, please. Upstream of the amino, um, the um, nucleotide plus one, which is really the transcription start site. So this is something which has cost lots, lots of very difficult work to be summarized here. I don't know, but maybe uh, it took 10 years to uh, understand all the scheme. And of course, uh, I do not have a full understanding of this. And uh, this is quite uh, uh, impressive because it is a huge thing here, which has been built. So now ribonucleotides are added complementary to the codex strand of DNA. So we have this synthesis, which has started by the five prime end of the RNA, and this will progress and we'll have the uh, NTPs, which have been, we will be added into this emerging RNA, which is here, and copying the template strand. That means that the RNA has the same sequence as the coding strand, except for the uh, U and uh, 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 U addition. So the nucleotides are added to the end, the free prime end of the RNA. And this pushes the, this pushes the, the um, already synthesized thing out of the site. Well, to make it simple, of course, the people in books make a very nice complex drawing. And you can see that in here, in fact, there is not only the region which will be copied, which is in, taken into account, but also other things in the same molecule on the, of DNA, where, which are called enhancers. Enhancers are very specific proteins, some uh, linked to an activator. This activator will bind to some parts of a complex and activate, accelerate the transcription and then the transcription starts. So, of course, this can be more complicated if you go into more details. We will not do it right now, of course. Then the RNA transcription starts and we'll read all the coding region. I'm sorry, I wanted to get rid of This, how do I do? It takes part of it. Okay. No, okay. Of course, all the genes are not transcribed all the time uh, in all the cells, so you have to have some signaling to say, hey, I need protein X, and this protein has to be pro uh, produced in the cell of your heart, let's say. And um, so I have some information telling the interior of the cell that, that all the things, oh, a nice cut. <laughs> Um, yeah, you have a signaling process, and the signaling process usually comes from the outside of the system, and take it your favorite signal transduction pathway, whatever could be an outside uh, receptor which will 
with a signaling cascade lead to the activation of the, the gene could be also something which is in, introduced inside the cell, for instance, uh, an androgen or uh, um, vitamin such as uh, uh, vitamin D, sterols, and this will be directly acting with DNA. In any case, you have to have a signal transaction pathway generating activators. The activators will interact with nucleosomes, and uh, many of these lead to a 5 methylcytosine in DNA and can be also acetylation, phosphorylation, methylation of histones. To in a new histones are the proteins that hold the DNA compact around these nucleosomes, these little uh, parts of uh, compacted uh, DNA. Then this will elicit also the activity of co-activators, but also of co-repressors. Sometimes you have to say, stop, we have enough. So this is uh, not, uh, it is a go or no go. And then all the factors and several others will be recruited, recruited inside the pre-initiation complex, the RNA pool pool, with all these things which are recognized the data box and the initiation complex, and then will lead to a DNA transcript. And the DNA transcript itself will have processes we will see a little bit later, elongation, splicing, processing factors, and so on. So this is quite a regulated machinery. Of course, it is. it has to be regulated because otherwise it will be chaos, anarchy. Everybody, every gene say, hey, I want to be transcribed. Why? It is my will. It, of course, it does not the way. It stays not the way it works. The way it works is that genes are expressed when the protein is needed. But, well, okay, we've started. Good. But we have to stop because there is a lack of specificity and of necessity to uh, get inside uh, the cell or outside the cell the protein of interest. So it has to be regulated as a starting point, but also it has to be regulated at the end of the system. And this is somehow, somehow tricky. Not very complicated, but tricky. As soon as the RNA polymerase pol pol 2 is on the DNA, it has something which is CTD, a uh, section which is phosphorylated, that links a torpedo RNAs. I do not remember why it is called torpedo, but I think it is because of its shape. It's very simple. And this torpedo RNAs is then recreated to the working polymerase two. And at this same moment, the mRNA is capped. There's something which is put at the end, five frame end, to make it quite resistant to uh, the RNAs which are, which are plenty. Then the process goes on. And at the moment, there is some kind of uh, Poly-A signal, which is not the one on the Tata box. It's something else. It's a, a polymer, um, polyadenylate with a U again. And then this is very specific because no protein has this sign on it. 
when when the torpedo RNA sees this thing, it starts showing the exiting uh, RNA, which is here. And then the exiting RNA will fall out, will fall out of the complex and be free. And also the torpedo RNAs will show not only this, but we still start to show the produces the products of a pole, RNA pole, which are the copies or non-relevant uh, parts of uh, DNA, the first DNA. And uh, this will, at the end, make a, a, colli a collision, if I may say, but collide. And the RNAs and the uh, torpedo RNAs collide. That makes stop the RNA polymerase work. And the deassembly of the RNA towards the, um, the, the DNA and uh, the RNA pole will go out and all the factors will get separate and then transcription will stop even if some part of the RNA of no, no uh, of the DNA of no interest at that moment for this real transcription will be uh, destroyed. So the thing is, first step, cap the mature RNA as soon as it exists, it exits from the site of synthesis. See that at one moment, there is a poly A site cleavage, activating the um, torpedo RNAs, and the torpedo RNAs will show the things, and this makes the um, RNA stop because no, nothing is produced, nothing is inside, and then the equilibrium will, will do that. All the complex will be released in the uh, nu nucleoplasm and the transcription stops. This is very, very interesting to see how it is. It is not that far complicated, but this also took a very, very long time to um, be uh, understood by the researchers on these things. When we are with, uh, well, they say here a mature mRNA. No, it is with uh, uh, mRNA, which has been already produced, not really the end of the story. What is capping? Capping is something which is specific to um, RNA. Um, you see that, you, you remember that all the bases are uh, three prime, five prime linked. And in here, the addition of a methylated guanine will be done in such a way that this will be a four prime, five prime trisphosphate linkage. In, in here, there are the two ribozo, riboses, which are linked together by a triphosphate. This is never seen in natural molecules in the cell, except in this place. This is the five prime RNA end, and this is the set seven methyl guanosine, which has been added to this thing, creating this peculiar thing. You see this um, free uh, phosphates only on ATP, GTP, and so on, but never in other kind of uh, polynucleotides. Um, and this makes it resistant to some extent against 
RNA de, uh, degrading, de degrading things. Um, it is a protection which is not absolute. And if you wanted to have this more protected, you have to take more precautions and this will be um, done uh, with uh, mRNA vaccines, for instance. Because the half-life of an mRNA in a, a normal cell, let's say um, something on, on the muscle, is about uh, around the order of like the minute, not the hours. So it is important if you want to inject RNA as a vaccine, as we all heard a few months ago, to protect the RNA against degradation. And in any case, even with all the protections they, did, they uh, provided in the vaccines, the half-life of uh, modified RNAs were around, were in the order of hours, not more. So it's, it was something important. It is something important because despite of the vaccines, uh, mRNA will, will be maybe one of the way to go to treat possibly some cancers or some other diseases. So this is the capping, the five capping, which is naturally occurring and it is mandatory otherwise the RNAs will show up this and the uh, mRNA will be destroyed as soon as produced. But what's up next? We have not a mature RNA as said in the former slide, but we have a pre-mature mRNA and we ne need other processing which takes place inside the uh, nucleus and uh, this is so-called RNA processing. So the premature mRNA will give rise to a mature mRNA. And this is the mRNA we will be translated into polypeptides after having exited the nucleus and this is in ribosomes and on the RAF endoplasmic reticulum. This is true, of course, for eukaryotic cells. In non-eukaryotic cells, you don't have exactly the same thing. You don't have a nucleus. That makes it simple. Another way to see it is this kind of um, scheme. Um, at what point I had it in Bahasa, but I, I lost it. <laughs> I'm sorry. And this is uh, very well what we have said so far in here. Analysis, what we will do, we will see maturation. I put in this oval. Don't ask me the color. I don't see it. Well, I don't know it. I see it. I do not know it. And then we have a little word on cytosol and then the plasmic reticulum. Let's go to this thing, which is in this oval thing. This is called maturation. We have not talked today, to, to, uh, up to now, of the fact that in DNA, there are coding and non-coding parts, which are uh, following each other. This is one gene, whatever gene it is, and suppose that in these genes, we have four exons. The exons are the parts who code for the protein. But inside, there are introns. And uh, to be honest and not speculative, um, we will not, we do not know really well why we do have introns, introns in here. But this is a non-coding part. This is a coding part, non-coding, coding, non-coding, coding, non coding, coding. We cannot keep this as is, because if we translate all this, of course, this part, which is said non-coding for this gene, will be coded, and the protein will not be the good one. So during transcription, the 
RNA polymerase two does, does not know if it is an exon or an intron. So it translates in a pre RNA, which is a full sequence between the start point and the end point. So this has to be eliminated, and it is a rather complex system, which is called splicing. We will not enter in the, in, into the mechanisms of this because it is chemistry of the nucleotides themselves. And um, well, it's quite, quite difficult. And then after removing all these introns from intron copy from the pre mRNA, we go to mature RNA. Don't forget in here, we still have um, five cream cap. And in here, we'll have, and we have not uh, mentioned that, we have a part of polyadenylate, uh, many uh, A will be added in here. It's a polyadenylation of the, the RNA. This is because we have to protect again the mRNA. Five frame caps protects, uh, pro protects against RNA starting here. But of course, in here, we have to do something in order to make the RNA sure before destroying the mature RNA. And this goes to translation with uh, exons, which have been translated here. Uh, this is, of course, an artistic view. <laughs> but sometimes all the exons have to be translated. Sometimes only several have to be translated. So with one gene, we, that gives this pre-mRNA, you still see the exons here, the introns and the four exons, for instance, you can have an alternative splicing in a system which is, I personally do not know, you can get a full length with the four exons or any kind of alternative forms instead, for instance, one, three, four, or one, two, three, or two, three, or one, four, etc. So this means that this gene here, supposed to code for four different places to be translated, in certain occasions will be partly translated. It has been transcribed, but it is partly trans, um, translated. So you have a protein which is full length or not full length or differently not full length. So you may have in here one gene, many proteins. This is the first point we could talk, uh, the first time we talk of that. The simple way, simple way is, is one gene, one protein. This was when I was a student uh, some time ago, more for, for um, 40, oh yeah, more than 40 years, oh yeah. <laughs> 45, 40, so more, almost 50. And then 50, yeah, 50 years, oh. I'm getting old, maybe, no? Um, then came this alternative splicing story at the beginning of the 70s. And it introduced something which is very interesting. One, put, one gene can give rise to many proteins. Well, many, not 100, of course, but many proteins, many protein chains. I am here talking about proteins, only the polypeptides, all the maturation of proteins are possible, uh, glycosylation, phosphorylation, etc. 
But this is not dependent on genes. It is dependent on other processes. So these are the polypeptide strands. These polypeptide strands will be then also processed. And this one can be, for instance, uh, phosphorylated, acetylated, uh, name it. So we have with only one strand of polypeptide, we may have several proteins depending on the state of the, the, the cell. So one gene produces one or more polypeptides and every polypeptide may have its life on itself. So that means that the dogma is not one gene, one mRNA, one uh, protein. The actual knowledge is one gene, several mature messenger RNAs, and then one mature messenger RNA produces only one polypeptide chain, but this polypeptide chain will be ultimately changed into in the, in the cytosol. Well, let's forget this. This is the take home message. In the DNA, we have a chain of nucleotides, which extends from here to here and far from the left and far from the uh, to the right. There can be sites which are enhancer and silencer linked. There are promoters, can be proximal or core, forget it. And we have a part of the gene, we have not spoken of that because it's too specific, which is a five frame, five prime untranslated region of the DNA just before the starting point, the starting point here, and then exon, introns, and so on, up to the start, and then the three prime untranslated region of the gene itself, here it is, which is terminator. Then the transcription will, to be honest, start not at the starting point of the translation after, it starts uh, um, earlier with the untranslated region and translated means what it means is in here that it changes. And it also incorporates the untranslated region as the free prime. So you have first a pre-mRNA, which has which is capped, and then the, um, the sequence will be read, a poly A tail will be added, and the region of his interest is this, and then you get the protein. Next step. Prediction to proteins. I just have to see something. Shall we? Wait, wait, yeah. Ah. I propose to have a 10 minutes break now. Um, you can um, have tea, of course cookies, of course. Um, you can also ask me questions one at a time. I will try to answer. I will not promise, promise to answer. And so I, I propose we reconvene in, um, well, 10 minutes. I, Ibuna Bila, is it okay? Yes, Prof. So for all participants, you can take a break for 10 minutes, Prof. Yep. Yes, 10 minutes. And uh, if you want to ask a question, you can ask uh, directly to Prof. Nicole. And also maybe some people want to go for praying. So it is time to go. If it is time to go, go. Ten for minutes. praying. Yeah, yeah, 10 sure. minutes is enough. If it, if it is time to go now, please go and tell me when you are ready to come back. 
Yeah. But people who still stay with us can ask questions. Of course. So please. Maybe I will take a, a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> I got glass of coffee. Oh, I'm, I, I recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> I do not recognize the, the landscape behind you. <laughs> no coffee. So I... I will get my glass of water. See you in a few minutes. Saya salat dulu ya, Bu Nabila.
I'm sorry, Prof. Marco. Yes, sure. I am I here have, for this. I have some questions for you. Like introns and exon is like um like new word for me. Uh, I read about it so little before, and I'm still have question like why introns should be removed. Um, and what happened if intron were failed um, to be removed? I'm sorry, there, there was some in interference. You ask why introns should be removed? Should be removed. Yeah, before the okay. translation. Okay. Okay. Um, this slide, right? Yes. Okay. okay. If introns stay here, the translation will be of all the nucleotides from this five prime to three prime, okay? Okay. These are nucleotides. Uh, uh, this is uh, ATCG uh, nucleotides. So if this is fully translated, you have mm -hmm. a protein which has this part, this part, this part, this part, this part, this part, and this part, okay? Okay. Protein has these things. Unfortunately, the protein must have only one, two, three, four, five, uh, whatever. The, the question, you, you are really right. Uh, it is a very good question because I will say it in another reply, uh, way. Why are there introns in the DNA sequence? This I don't know. Nobody really knows, maybe the specialists. But this I don't know. Maybe it is because other proteins can start here, for instance. And the sequence will be very different. Maybe. Maybe these are uh, places where some, up to my knowledge, regulations take place, place. I do not know. But imagine this as a line of ATCG. Any place can be a starting point. But of course, if I start here, I will not get this sequence. I will get another sequence. Um, let's say here, no, not good. Okay, I started here, okay? Okay. If this is not the one I wanted, but let's imagine I have another a A U G somewhere. Unfortunately, I don't see. <laughs> but for... imagine, imagine. Okay. But there is something here, an A U G here. Of course, what I will read is this, but shifted from one to all uh, nucleotides. So at the end the mRNA will be very different. Okay. This is the main question. Why are there interns? Honestly, I do not know. People, other people should know, but not me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Ross. Uh, do, do, this, does this answer to your question? Yeah, it is. Okay. So maybe I have um... If um, if the intron like failed to remove, so we got um, like the wrong protein or mm -hmm. other proteins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is it. This is it. This Thank is you, it. Prof. Yeah, thanks for the question, which was uh, pertinent. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think.
Yeah, I think there is a example uh, disease with uh, intron include in in the translation of uh, moco. Mm -hmm. I, for example, in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, they have as part of the intron include in the translation. So we call oh. so for example minus three exon exon five minus t two five means a three base pair of exon two to uh, uh, exon five three base pair of intron to uh, exon five uh, something like this yeah it could be um in, in as, this, mm, mm, mm. Yes, yes, I sure. I don't understand why uh, you yeah, have to be removed. Yeah, Vanessa is good. Good question. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Brian. It's almost what what you say is this. Um, this one, it yeah. skipped one of translation region. Mm -hmm. And this one only three three exon. Yes. And what happened with the, with the person who have missing one exon? I do, I do not know. Maybe uh, persons who work on that know, know why, I don't know, but how they should know. Uh, but you may, you may even imagine that we have a very defective protein which has only translation of one and four and this always is skipped why i do not know and this alternative spacing is clearly a, a way to have several different proteins the sequence is the same you just for instance skip this one but the, apart from that, the amino acids will be the same, except that there were all this place which will be lacking. But it does not change the last of the one or the first of the exon three. There is no mutation at the moment. It is only a deletion. It's so uh, if you have a, a protein with, let's say, to be simple, 10 amino acids, if we skip the part two and three, the remaining uh, seven, uh, eight amino acids are the same. Is it clear? I'm not sure. <laughs> I will do it again. Imagine you have a protein with a sequence of 10 amino acids, okay? Then, for some reason, the alternative splicing gives one, two, three, but not four, five, six. But the amino acids, one, two, three, four, the proteins are still the same. Four, five, six will get off. But seven, eight, nine are the same as in the first protein. Even if it is not 10, now it is uh, seven amino acids. So if it's, let's say with uh, letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, G, uh, G. Okay, then I have no seeds. I will forget this. I have always thumb, first finger, <laughs> thumb, blah, 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 the same. This is the protein. I skip this once. It doesn't change the sequence of the protein. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the protein. The protein is my 10 fingers. Okay. I forget to put these ones. The other fingers are always the same. It is not changed. And this was coded by the intern I did not use. Is it clearer or less? <laughs>
Is it clear or not? I am, it's important as a question. What you asked? Um, so know? it's still like 10 fingers, okay. but it's like an empty, like. Yep. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, except empty, but these two, of course, are linked. Huh? It oh. is not. It is not a hole. It is a hole because uh, well, it's fingers. <laughs> So maybe okay. it can cause like um mutation or something like um yes go go ahead go ahead like um maybe uh the expressive of the gene like um like um in people maybe like illness or is it only um they produce like um different protein like I want like ten but because mm -hmm. two is missing but it's still like 10 fingers like mm -hmm. it's empty mm -hmm. so they produce um like the wrong protein ah, is it like that ah ah my fingers are wrong okay because if i less i lack these two things i will be in trouble but with proteins i do not know it is not the same protein i don't say it is the wrong protein okay i see it so is it's the same. Different. For, well, the same. Of course, it's not the same, but it is the, the protein by itself is shorter. But maybe it works better, or doesn't work, or nothing happens. Well, nothing happens is because I do not see it happen. Because for for sure it happens. But it is not like with a mutation. Will we change the sequence of a protein? If a mutation changes the amino acid, of course, I get a wrong protein. Then in here, I have a full size protein. In here, I have a deleted protein shorter. Yeah. And another deleted protein, which is shorter than this one. But this sequence three in here is the same as in here, and it is the same as in here. But the link two to three in here is, of course, the same as in here. That is here. The lack, the, the link between the part two and the part three lacks. And it is replaced by a link between part three and one. But the amino acids in here are the same as in here. The amino acids in here are the same as in here, and so on. There's not a mutation. It is something which does not change the, <laughs> the open hidden frame. Or oh, forget it. But does not change the, the sequence of what is expressed. It changed, it changes the real length of a protein. And this, next time I will put a slide on that. It is very interesting, important question. Thanks, Ibu Ivanisa. Thank Thanks. you, Prof. Prof. Okay. Prof. Next time I will add it. Yes? Prof. Is it? Is it possible this one that causes a microdeletion? Like when we examine a chromosome, we couldn't find any abnormality. When we do chromosomal microarray, we can find a microdeletion. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. uh, when we check from the literature, is actually the microdeletion not really uh, code the gene. So, we didn't call as a FUS variant of unsignificance. And we cannot say that this is pathogenic variant. Is it like this maybe? So they have deletion, but they are normal and they are not the cause of disease. Is it like this? Because now yes. since- Yeah, yeah. Since I, I, I try to, to figure out this. If the micro edition is in a coding part, for sure, then the sequence of this protein will be changed, right? Mm. 
if it is in a non-coding part, for instance here, and if the intron is correctly deleted, because of course there are problems in the junction in here or in here, if this is changed, uh, all the protein will be um, messed up. If this is saved, the junction between the intron and the next exon or the former exon and the intron are yeah. saved. And if all the structures in here are conserved, silent, the, the mm -hmm. micro deletion will be silent. However, these are the coding parts. If we go up, coding parts are not all the a sequence of introns and exons. There are non coding parts. If there are non coding parts, and if the micro deletion is in the coding part, if it does not change the open reading frame, the part which will be translated, it is silent. Silent regarding to this. I don't say if it is silent regarding to other things. Regarding the expression of genes, if something non related to some translation is not affected, I believe there is no differences in expression. But micro deletions are such as also uh, mutations or yeah. uh, large deletions may have or may not have any kind of um, of um, clinical manifestation. Yeah, yeah. But because uh, what I f I didn't put it in because it's not said in um, your eukaryotes. In in prokaryotes, I should have told. Tolkien uh, of open reading frame. That means that this somewhere says, oh, okay, this is a reading frame. It is open for translation. And then we stop. In eukaryotes, we do not say that. But it is the same. If this is not translated, translated only maybe by one nucleotic acid. If it is translated by one to left or to right, everything downstream is changed. The sequence is not the same. And if it is made in such a way that it doesn't change the place of the starting point is and the ending point is, that's okay. So this, this has to be studied for every uh, deletion and or um, micro deletion or deletion or uh, mutation. Because um, I am not sure the figures, but I, I believe that the genes are really very, very little parts of the total genome. Um, I, I, I am not sure of which figures, but I, I, I imagine that you have 30,000 genes, let's say. But we have enough DNA to make several times more. So what is the use of non-translated DNA? So far, I don't know. I do not know. Maybe somebody in here, in you, in your, in this class, uh, uh, or your professors know, but I do not know. Okay, so um, is it time to start again? Yeah, I think so. Okay. More than 10 minutes already. Okay, good, good, perfect. Okay, well, next step, traduction into proteins. The mRNA sequence is divided in codons, three letters, three letters, a codon. 
And this sequence is read by transfer volumes, from transfer RNAs. And if the mRNA has a codon, the transfer F has pardon, plenty of codons, the transfer RNA has only one codon. And this is specific for each 30, 30, 31 amino acid, and all the process takes place in ribosomes. This is called the genetic code. You see, for instance, if I find on the mRNA UUU or UUC, I will bind the complementary anticodon US pair to A. So I will have a AAA mRNA phenylalanine and so on. Two for leucine, no. One, two, three, four, five, six for leucine. Nobody knows exactly why. Uh, this is this is redundant, uh, redundant. Three for alanine. Only one for methionine, which is always the first amino acid of the existing protein. It will be formed. It will be changed after. And there is also, it is also the um, start point for transduction. Trans, uh, transduction, yeah. So you have many for valine, many for serine, for proline, for threonine, for alanine, etc. And several, not so many, three are stop codons. That means that this is the end of the part which has to be synthesized and translated into proteins. I have a tiger mosquito here. We have all the mosquitoes. <laughs> and then um, this is one almost universal. A very, very little parts on the human uh, of uh, living things with some little discrepancies. And so you can see that, let's take uh, leucine. Leucine has four codons, but all three begin with CU and then another one. So it is some kind of checking CU, okay, CU is leucine. But to be sure, it has been added a <laughs> third. I don't know who added this, not the men, as nature. Uh, you can see this for serine, you see, you see, you see, and then other things. But if you look at the code, CU, you never encounter a known of this. CU is only for leucine. So a code is semi degenerated. It could work with two letters, but it is not safe enough. It is too a, sh a short um, sequence. So the selection has given three letters. Okay? So you can check. Huh? If you don't trust me, check. <laughs> The third letter is well, is mandatory, but can be changed. Any of UCAG, any of this. Okay, what happens? It's just a very simple uh, chemical reaction, which is done. You have here an amino acid, which is already incorporated in the, the, the protein, well, well, the peptide, and then you add another amino acid. So 
the N terminal as synthesized first, and the C terminal will be synthesized last. And then after one round, you have a dipeptide and then a tie and then blah, blah, and so on. But always the protein beginning will be N NH2. So the groups will be added corresponding to the codons present on RNA. In here, this is a nice picture of RNA. Well, let's forget the fantastic condition on the colors of the RNA. It is the whole shape of an RNA. But we see here the second eye, which is more important. Here is the place of the anticodon. So the, the anticodon will bind to the codon. Then it is supported by a specific loop. There is a double-stranded RNA part. There are loops which are variable. Nobody knows why. With some double-stranded parts here also. And then you have this acceptor loop with only five amino acids, um, five nucleotides here, which will bind to the amino acid, which has to be added. The amino acid to be added is the one that corresponds to codon, of course, to the anticodon and the codon. So it is a um, very complicated shape, very complicated molecule, only nucleotides with two parts, very important, this one and this one. Chemistry behind, behind this in here is rather complicated. Let's forget it. So the system works as we have already said. The amino acid is here, the anticodon is here. Let's say it has CUC from three to five prime, and on the mRNA from five to prime, uh, three to prime, you will pair to GAG. GAG, 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 where is GAG? It's glutamine. It's glutamine. And not all, no, no, nothing else. So this is easy. And then you will read the next and the next and the next and the next and add the next amino acid. This is not done in the soluble um, um, cytosol. We are now in the cytoplasm. It will be done in a complex polysome form. Um, ribosome, which are assembled in two polysomes. Ribosome is this, the strand of mRNA elicits the um, assembly of many, many protein, uh, proteins. We see a little bit more of that. And then it reads the, the first and it puts a methionine and blah, 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 blah until you stop with them. And then it is the end of the story. This is not translated. This was only added to protect against destruction of um, messenger RNA, such as the fine prime, five prime um, um, capping. Where does this take place? We already spoke of that in ribosomes. This is a ribosome. Very often they assemble into polysomes because there are several ribosomes reading each of the other one reading the uh, mRNA. So there is only one, not, there is not only one ribosome. There are several ribosomes who will read the messenger RNA. 
And this can be seen in electron micrographs. And this is why it has been called the half endoplasmic reticulum. And this is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum waiting to be activated by the lecture of the RNA. Quite easy. So this is a ribosome. It is a huge, very huge uh, complex with um, call that, the valley where is read the messenger RNA with its codons. And in here, this is a complicated structure with, to make it simple, an accepting site for a messenger RNA loaded with its amino acid, a synthesis site, protein sites, a peptide site, where the amino acids from here will be transferred to the COOH terminal of the peptide under construction. And then the free um, transfer RNA will go to the exit site, it will be released. And then pew, everything will change uh, holes, the A site, Will uh, be and will become a P site. Everything thing is here uh, translated to the left. I'm sorry, I thought I, you were you saw it. Everything is translated to the left, and then the ribosome follows the mRNA. Or the mRNA shifts uh, inside the ribosome. I don't know exactly. Maybe a more pretty thing. You still have this mRNA with, for instance, here a codon, the anticodon of this tRNA binds. Transfer is added into a terminal, C terminal serine of the ongoing synthesized peptide. And then this shifts to here. The A, the, the thing was which was in A will go here. The next, the, no, the previous, I mean, um, tRNA will be uh, ejected. And then the cycle is continuing. And the E site will be occupied by, by this P RNA, which has lost this, this, since it has been linked to this, and this translated. And, um, so it's, well, it's quite um, simple, may I say that? Well, it's very efficient. So, we have already seen uh, that more or less. And uh, I, I missed uh, several parts of the, of the thing here because I see you, which is a very good thing. Um, oh, we get this off. Not better. Not any better. Okay. So this is what they said. When the mRNA enters the uh, cytoplasm, it's always already recruited by the small ribosomal unit on the endoplasmic reticulum. The large ribosomal unit comes and tRNA will be recreated. Then, this is the integration process we have seen. And at the end, the stop codon in here, UAG, will act as a release factor because it will ask for um, 
specific tRNA and nothing to transfer, and then the uh, peptide will go will be freed uh, of uh, the ribosome. So where are we so far? When needed, a gene is transcribed into mRNA, which is important, it is when needed. Then the messenger RNA is processed as needed, capping mandatory, polyadenylation mandatory, and then splicing. Splicing, I do not know exactly what are the rules, to say, I will translate only one, two, not three, but four. I do not know this. There are some regulations. It is not abnormal. What I forgot to say, it is not abnormal. It is normal. It is something which should or must or can happen. But in, in no way, it is an abnormal process. This is normal. So then the large subunit and the small subunit unit make a ribosome, bring in all the amino acids, and the, this goes to the protein chain. Several other processes will lead to a mature protein, but this was not the, the theme of this topic. And um, well, it's a quite an important thing. Since defects of maturation of proteins can be defects of function of protein. So we have already seen this one. This is the regulation part. This is the elongation part with all the whole bunch of participants. And of course, it is something for specialists. Anyhow, I would like to focalize a little bit on this cycle here, just a few, few minutes, because it is important to say that the transcription of one given gene is regulated, except for instance, for things which are um, housekeeping genes, which are always making uh, the thing because the house has to be clean all the way, right? No? <laughs> so housekeeping genes do not have this kind of things. All the others have this. So we have a signaling cascade. Can be extra uh, membrane, membrane linked in here with the receptor and the transmembrane receptor, which elicits a cascade, will activate a transcription factor. Or this can be simpler, this is not mandatory. If you have a, a steroid, you can go directly here and activate the transcription factor. These things in here are kinases, for instance, or, um, well, let's say kinases to be simple. And then the tissue factor the um, transcription factor will enter the, the, the nucleus and help start the transcription. Here you can recognize the new uh, Lee assembled um, polymerase. And then the transcription will give rise to protein. For the first time, you see, I mentioned chromatin with stars. Because this is a nucleosome, it is with a chromatin modification. The nucleosome is chromatins with wrapped um, DNA. And uh, an important point is that uh, this protects DNA and translation can occur only if something happens and freeze the DNA from its links to the uh, nucleosome. Okay, 
So the activation is linked to a specific transcription factor, which has activated itself by a specific signaling cascade. I insist on specific. There is not only one transcription factor, there are transcription factors specific for almost every gene. It is always um, a collaboration between a specific signal to a specific transcription factor to a specific gene. This is the, really the place to, the, the thing to, do not forget. Okay. Another way to see this. This is a specific thing. We have a bacteria which invades our body. There is some receptor which is specific for bacteria. In here, this is on the plasma in the plasma membrane. This specific bacter um, receptor for a given bacteria will activate a kinase. This kinase will phosphorylate I kappa B, and then NF kappa B will be shifted from its equilibrium with uh, the inhibitory. I kappa B, and then the NF kappa B will enter the nucleus and give rise to a lot of anti-inflammatory anti cytokines, RANTES, uh, EL8, uh, TNF, uh, and blah. So this binding as, co as a consequence, the transcription of the mRNA to this, and transcription of these three genes will elicit the production, of course, of the same protein. But the thing is tricky. If this was to work, we will get a chronic inflammation. If we produce too, many, too much interleukins, we get too much inflammation processes. And then the same NF kappa B will also activate the synthesis of I kappa B, its inhibitor. And then this is an equilibrium between the production of pro-inflammatory uh, proteins. But since this has to be stopped, at the same moment, there is a self-inhibitory loop and this self-inhibitory loop is modulated ex uh, essentially by the, I, uh, the kinase. And the modulation makes that if there is much I kappa B synthesized, it will recruit NF kappa B, who will not be able to, be go, to go to the nucleus. And then this will stop. It is a self-inhibitory loop. This is, if you think things are well designed, inflammation needs inflammatory, but the body does not need much inflammatory. It's not very good for the body. So when bacteria arrives, everything works. This is produced, will fight against the bacteria and so on. But at the same moment, we have not to be overwhelmed by the um, inflammation, and then we have to stop it. So we have inhibition by NF kappa B by the shift of phosphorylated dephosphorylated inhibitor I kappa B, and this will stop at one moment the, um, the thing here. Some viruses, uh, not to name it um, coronavirus, may have bas bypassed this kind of things. And then the poor inflammatory thing was uh, in under certain circumstances, 
circumstances, very, very exaggerated. So far, so far we have finished with, um, almost finished with genetics. Because we said that up to now, we have assumed that all is supported only by the DNA sequence. Okay, we have a whole of signaling pathways which are reactive to the environment, which is the central old dogma of uh, 10, uh, 2000, let's say. This is true. This is still true. Nothing to say. This is still true. But of course, as usual in, in, in science, when you have something which is definitely demonstrated, something will just say, yes, but that little case, mm, maybe something else happens. Here we say that say signaling was reactive to the environment. Now we will say DNA and our protein modifications, forget it now. DNA can be modified by the environment. DNA modified by the environment is something we can understand quite easily. But it is not genetics now. It is around genetics. It is just something which is, here, are genet here is genetics, but all the things outside are around genetics. And this is going as to be epigenetics. There are many, 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 many definitions of epigenetics. This is a um, listen, we will have a specialist, I suppose, in, in the near future. But just to say it quite simply, epigenetics changes and affects the gene expressions in different ways. It is not genetics because it's, it does not supposed to be transmitted. So far, I am here. I say, so far, epigenetics are modifications of DNA, but it doesn't change. It does not um, make mutations. It, it is, I don't understand why it should be inherited and so on. So the thing, first thing is DNA methylations. Typically, methylations of genes can then uh, turn them off and demethylation on. Well, this is true or not. Because the methylations adds a group of um, uh, methane to the DNA at specific places on the DNA, but also this has for consequence to block proteins that attach to DNA. However, there is at least one or two instances where methylations are used to start uh, the stabilization of DNA. So it is something which is so and so. Then we have histone modifications. DNA wraps around proteins called histones. When histones are tightly packed to, uh, together, and the DNA also, the reading of the gene is not easy. So as a consequence, the gene is high hidden, and its expression is Turn off. Someone raise hand for the question, well, Profoko. The link between DNA and histone, the link is uh, just a kind of link as I, when I hold this uh, pen, of course, it, there is a link between Profoko. my hand and the pen. And I, Profoko, I someone raise hand for the, the question. Person. So the DNA can be freed 
And then usually this needs, means that the gene will be genes will be read and transcribed. Pero this poco, is okay resten. as far as no external perturbations occur. But chemical groups can be added and uh, this can be methylate or demethylate the histones and also the DNA. And this will uh, make the histones uh, more tightly or more loosely packed depending on where it is. And there are several hundred possibilities, possibilities. And then these chemical groups are prone to change the expression without changing the, the coding, eh? the code stays here. What kind of chemical groups or easy? Tobacco, pollution, chemistry, um, fumes from the plants and so on. You know this very well, I know. And then also there are other things which are non-coding RNA. We didn't speak of that because it is very complicated. MicroRNAs, SERNA, and so on. This is made by transcription of RNA or DNA, but it is a little uh, well, somewhat different from what we have seen. Non-coding RNA can control gene expression by attaching code to coding RNA that stops transduction. Um, this has been used uh, in the laboratories. But also, non-coding RNA may recruit other proteins that will modify histones and will then this is resulting turn genes on or off. So this is a classical epigenetics, DNA methylation, histone methylation, non-coding RNA. The two first things, DNA methylation and histone modifications are really due to pollutants. And the most important pollutant, of course, at, the, at one person's level is smoking. Nobody smokes, very good, perfect. So DNA methylation, histone modification, and non-coding RNA or silencing RNA. Non-coding is micro RNAs, silencing is SI RNAs. Quite a very difficult field, which is totally, totally um, in, in, in the field of um, things. I have something saying that Erling Listianin C. Raise hand. Uh, Nabila, can we have this question? Uh, yes, no? yes, yes, please. If uh, you can give uh, the, the yes. microphone to Erling. Uh, yeah, Bu Erling, silakan. The unmute. Yeah, thank you for the. You are on the top of my. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the opportunity, do, bro. Do not hesitate. However, I do not listen to you. <laughs> it is normal. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you hear my Sorry, voice? It's my fault. Uh, hey, bro. Can you hear my voice? Now, now yes, because my <laughs> my um, loudspeaker stopped. <laughs> to this <stand> <laughs> by. Thank you. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, uh, thank you for the very interesting lecture today, Prof. Uh, this about the epigenetics is um, uh, very interesting for me. Yeah, especially for the um, DNA methylation, Prof. Yeah, is there any um, uh, description, for example, of what the level of DNA methylation that can be called normal and 
how the level that can be called abnormal so this can uh, turn off the gene expression. Uh, no, wait. No, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but normal is not turned off uh, and uh, abnormal is turning on. It can be the reverse. I do not know if it is good to stop a gene or to let it go. So methylation can do this the two things, but I do not know if it is good or not, normal or abnormal. Please. Oh, okay. What I understand is the methylation of DNA is there, is there, but uh, about the level of the methylation, am I right, bro, or I'm wrong? The level of methylation. Yeah. Think, yeah. Well, um, I, I am not an expert at all, but. I believe that the more mitigations you have, the more you may have effects, good or worse or bad. I don't know. The, 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 the message is methylation is a regulatory thing. We do right. not master. Mm -hmm. If it is a good place to methylate, good place, what I call good place, maybe okay. it's not place, uh, that's okay. If it is in a non, in a, an adverse place, it is bad. But maybe also it is in a indifferent place. I never know about it. Never, I will never know that I have been methylated in such place. That does not mean that it has no effect. Maybe it has an effect I do not see. I do not know how to see it. Maybe this is it. Okay, so in different genes, different level methylation, something like that. Or... Yes, yeah, yeah. This is a good, a good way to say it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, Thanks. thank you for the. This is a good way. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Um, so this was uh, the same thing, and um, yeah. We are humans, so we have good things and bad things, but it's not sure that uh, it is good and bad. Uh, it is good in some circumstances and bad in other ones. I have a, a question by uh, Mentari Amir. Please, if... Yes. Uh, good morning, Prof Moko. Thank you for your time. I'm Antari. I have a question. Do epigenic, uh, epigenetic change become genetic mutation along generation? Ah, we see, we'll address this later. Okay. Okay. We we'll see it in in few minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. So, to stay with the classic way. So here you see a chromosome. And the artist has extracted chromatin, then DNA, and then you have methyl groups. Methyl groups can tag DNA and activate or repress genes. This is exactly with what we said with Ibu Erlin a few uh, minutes ago. Okay. Histones and proteins around which DNA can win will regulate in some part the regulation, the expression of genes, since when a DNA is tightly hidden in histones in the nucleosome, cannot be fed. But sometimes, of course, the, is, the, um, this thing, the nucleosome will open and then the DNA is accessible and can be translated, uh, transcribed. But you see, we have states, and these states can be also modified. And if you see all the, the, the picture, I don't see it because I have your um, videos. Um, where we close this? Okay. Okay. 
So we can say that epigenetic mechanisms are affected by many factors, many. Development, because in utero and childhood, uh, especially in utero, the fetus is exposed to chemicals we do not know. Women, the same, we find as environmental chemicals or ones which are taken by the mother or things. Drugs and pharmaceuticals can give also some kind of epigenetic mechanism by modifying the uh, methylation. Aging, of course, the oldest you are, the more methylated you are. So you are more methylated by, than uh, you, uh, young people. Diet, of course. Diet is very important. The things we, that give uh, DNA, um, modification of DNA, anything. But also you have something which is an end effect. It is that this leads to many, many diseases, such as cancer, autoimmune disease, mental disorders, diabetes, and so on. This is just a list. Uh, I know that mental disorders, of course, will be of prime interest when um, Ibu Prof. Uh, Sultana will talk, but all these things are important. So you have this thing, which is a chemical way of speaking of epigenetic mechanism, mechanisms that are around the DNA. And I insist it is around the DNA. That means it does not touch the DNA by itself. And then we come to the tricky part. It is a tricky part because, let's take it easy now, you are here, you are dependent on your genome, otherwise you will be a boy and not a girl. You are de dependent on genetic modulation and genetic modulation is your environment and also epigenetic modulators. And you see the cartoon, things like uh, your microbiome, for instance, can affect your uh, genetic expression by epigenetic modulation. It doesn't change your genome. Your genome is still the same. The sequencing is the same, except that, of course, there are some accidental modifications. But your diet, in here is good because it is fruits and uh, vegetables, no fat. You exercise, very good. Um, uh, in here, in Europe and America, this has been now, is, has become so, some kind of a drug. People exercise by far too much. It begins to be a, a, a disease. Um, last time I came to Indonesia, I was not sure that many people do much exercise, which is bad. Okay, maybe a change. I hope it changed. Of course, disease exposure. I don't know what is this kind of a ball with spikes. It reminds me of a Sputnik, but maybe it's a coronavirus. I don't know. The most important thing, toxic chemicals. The king of toxic chemicals is tobacco. And I heard very recently that clover cigarettes, the ones you, you, you have in, in Surabaya and so on, are even worse than pure tobacco cigarettes. And tuber, pure tobacco cigarettes are supposed to be the more nasty things you can use and not use if you have uh, the will and uh, the possibility. Drugs of abuse um, in the uh, Western world is something we do not know how to cope with. It is very, very, very awful 
the use of this uh, drugs of abuse. And then therapeutic drugs, of course, but well, this is important. And then there are other things which are more surprising. Your psychological state can set up some modifications of your gene expression. Conversely, that gene expression can affect your psychological state. We'll see better. Oh, well. uh, social relationships. If you do not have social inter interactions, you have some kind of gene expression on, of anxiety, of uh, not well being, and so on. Also, there are diurnal and seasonal correlations modulating your genes, your psychological state, I do not remember. And something which is awful to say, your financial status will affect your health, not because if you are poor, you have a poor quality of life, poor quality of food and so on, also because it is anxiety, it is something uh, a psychologist will, will decrive better than me, uh, but your financial status will change your gene expression. And of course, this is outside your genome, this is clear. So this is very, 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 very important to see all these things all over, which are aside, by side, um, sorry, sideways from genome, um, can affect your, gen, your genes without changing the sequence, but changing the expression. And this is extremely important to be, um, to think about it. And then we have to, to read this and to think about it. So far, I said, just at the moment, this does not change your genome. I stay with this. We do not change the genome and what we will see and say now. As soon, uh, as early as the 90s, um, Arthur Riggs in England, I guess, coined the term of epigenetics, which is something which is around the genetics, but it is heritable changes in gene function. Can you imagine the revolution it is? The genetics of a being or human being can be changed and this change without changing the sequence of your DNA will change something where you have inherited. This has worked now and um, the consensus definition of an epigenetic trait is a stably a heritable genome, a phenotype, excuse me. I say it again. A stable, heritable phenotype resulting from changes in a chromosome without alterations in the DNA sequence. So the chromosome it has affected, chromosome is histones and DNA. DNA sequence is still the same. However, you have a phenotypes that can be heritated from other persons, of, uh, from the, your parents. Later, not later, earlier, but it was known later, a developmental psychologist has written something which is important. 
encompassing the notion that we develop through an unfolding of our personality in predetermined, predetermined stages. This is our genome. Okay. But that our environment and surrounding culture environment for him is not only tobacco or the smoke of the Pertamina plant. The environment and the surrounding culture influence how we progress through the stages. That means that from early on in life, we have a package of genes. We will really, uh, um, end our life with almost the same package of genes, except for the accidents and so on. But the, this is in a, a relationship between social cultural settings, which will make the the infant and then the ch child and then the uh, teen and then us, we have certain genes which are expressed and not, which are not expressed. And this is totally psychologist point of view. The progress for each stage is in part determined by our success or lack of success in all the previous stage. Okay, we may say, yeah, of course, if I, I fail, I will fail. Or if I fail, I will uh, fight. But this simple choice, if I fail, I will fail again. Or saying, if I fail, I will fight not to fail again. The simple thing is determined by the expression of different genes, which are all for everybody inside the genomes. All the genes are the same, but the sequence of activating makes them forgotten or make them active. I don't know how you can believe it, but there are several proofs of that. And then there are even more provocative. So far, it is not absolutely uh, admitted, but epigenetic modifications are thought to be a biological mechanism for transgenerational trauma. What is a transgenerational trauma? It is something uh, your grandparents have suffered and you still have this stigmata. The DNA, once again, is not changed. We have still the same, absolutely the same, um, how I may say, the same um, sequence of DNA. There is not a change in here. The change is elsewhere. And the thing is, of course, is to find where. Um, This is something which is interesting. This is female rats. We have a transmission can, which can be intergenerational, the transmission we know, uh, F0 F generation is exposed to something. That means that the F1 generation has been exposed to this something during uh, its uh, maturation in the womb. So it is affected by the something, the toxic. Okay. But the F2 generation has not been in contact with the toxic. And of course, they are not sick. And the first generation are not sick. But there is another way a transgenerational. In transmission, the F0 trans uh, generation has been exposed to a toxic. This is important, it is a female, because females have two X 
and the males have one X and one Y. Then the first generation, of course, are exposed to the toxic during pregnancy. It has to be during pregnancy of the first, night, of course, and are exposed, okay? They are affected by the toxic, but in certain cases, the offsprings of these rat, uh, female rats, after two generations, they have never been in contact with the toxic, are still affected by something related to the toxic initial, initial toxic. And even the third generations, but great grandchildren of the mother which has been exposed to the toxic are still affected in some way. Not the same, the phenotype, phen uh, phenotype we change, maybe or not. And this is something which is very, very well documented in at least one case, well, many others. But this one is the one. This is the D. Fleur Silvestros. Silvestrol case, this, D, we say. It is an analog of estrogen, which has been given to pregnant women to during 30 years. The molecule has been synthesized in 1938-39. Without any trial, it has been given to pregnant women to, put, to protect them from uh, abortion or premature birth, or I don't know. It has been given in thousands of pregnancy. As soon as in 1971, almost immediately, the daughters, the babies at that moment, had a very rare vaginal tumor which is clear cell carcinoma. And then not only the babies, but the, the grown up girls, the, the daughters of the women who received this during the, the pregnancy um, have this rare vaginal tumor. And quickly many abnormalities were found in the generation of these daughters as well as these sons. So the daughters and the sons had problems, cancers, problems with fertility in, in uh, girls, but also in men, miscarriage, which is the, the, the thing was given to her mother to prevent miscarriage. Many men had hypospadias, various genita genital mal malfunctions, such as uh, cryptorchidia, uh, um, problems of anatomy of uh, uterine or vagina. Okay, but these are the daughters which have been exposed to the drug when the drug was given to their mother. Okay, but these women, despite of problems with fertility and so on, can have children. Then, then these were, are the grandchildren of a death treated woman. This person now did not have any contact with death during her life. There are still effects. That time, the genital, the genital malformations stay with men with hypospadias with very important uh, uh, frequency, cryptorchidia, um, poor sperm quality. Surprisingly, no more genital malformation in girls. But something which very, very surprising. Nobody understands why. In these persons, 
with grandchildren of these treated women, we have observed, we, they have observed esophageal atresia, a little bit far from what it was expected for pseudoestrogen, hand malformations, but very, very hard hand malformations, um, uh, they are really crippled persons. Maybe cerebral misdevelopment with um, some kind of um, uh, low Q, uh, IQ, but also attention disorder and hyperactivity disorders. This has been documented, this has been proved, it has been proved also, but nothing happened to the structure of their DNA. So where is the point of action of uh, this through all these generations so far? I do not know, maybe some persons know, I do not know. And now we are to the fourth generation, mm -hmm. the children are too young, uh, the question is still open, but the scientists of this field of, um, of research expect that we will have still defects on the offsprings of these uh, persons. So it's um, a terrible thing which makes many things uh, to, to be thought about. Um, we, we do not have to change things when things are not very difficult. The pregnancy of these women were, were not so bad. The medication has not been tested at all. It has been tested on rats and that's it. And now we have four, three at least generations with major disorders, um, major malformations. Um, well, it's just terrible. So we have a conclusion. Oh, I could, if you have five minutes time more, uh, talk about uh, two aspects which have been large scale also not experiments, but observations. In the late uh, 18th century or maybe 19th century in uh, Sweden, there were um, hunger, uh, very strong hunger. Um, the same in 42, 44 in Netherlands, extreme hunger due to the uh, occupation by the Nazis, of course. And these people, developed, of course, uh, many died, many survived, fortunately, but the children of this, the first were prone to um, diabetes, inflammation, and so on, and this has been passed on to the followers. Okay, anger, we understand. Second point, a very massive research is done on this, because Nobody understands very well how it works. All the persons who have been to uh, death camps of uh, the Nazis, uh, the German uh, Nazis, uh, the persons following Hitler uh, in uh, Dachau, how it treats and so on, mostly Jews, but also Roms and also communists. Uh, and also, um, I don't know, um, the survivors had children. And these children have specific markers of expression of something which is related to a huge stress, a threatening life stress, which can be measured by uh, uh, several uh, uh, expression of genes. Of course, the genome is still the same. The second generation has still this problem. Uh, and 
the psychologists say it is not because uh, survivors have uh, told the children that it is uh, bad and, uh, and so on. No, it is something which is chemically somewhere. It is not the gene which have been changed. The expression of the genes have been changed, but not the genes by themselves. And uh, this, of course, is less terrible. Well, it's less terrible, I don't know. Um, no, no value judgment, but there are no death. It is not with the same with these. But it is this. We can understand this molecule. Uh, we can understand that. A molecule is bad, can be linked to something, and so on and so on. But in here is only a stress. It is not hunger for the Jews in, uh, in the uh, concentration camps. It was hunger for the Dutch people. But all these have this kind of transgenerational transmission of a stress. So, we have to make a conclusion now. I think it is about time. I think this conclusion is really dedicated for you, young people who will be genetic counselors, who will be in some kind in, on ethics, on ethics, uh, which is, I think, something central. And of course, you have also to, to fight against fakes. So this is a conclusion I took as it was in a valuable book, but I forgot which book. So at this point, some scientists have questioned whether epigenetic inheritance compromises the foundation of a modern synthesis. The modern synthesis is genes, messenger RNA, and then um, proteins. That is the dogma. Well, Nobel Prize in France, and we don't have so many. I'm very proud of uh, these people. Outlining this central dogma of molecular biology, when the best, uh, no, I cannot say best, uh, more than best scientist in history of uh, biology, Francis Crick, others, yes, Declination, very interesting. DNA is held in a configuration by histones so that it can act as a passive template. It is important to say it is a passive template. DNA does not, is not modified, it is DNA, period. For the simultaneous synthesis and of RNA and proteins. None of the detailed information, information that means the sequence of a protein, the sequence of DNA and the sequence of a protein is in this stone. However, the article is closed by this, and this is Francis Crick saying that, this scheme explains the majority of the present, the present experimental results. The majority, that means that some are not explained. And indeed, the emergence of a genetic inheritance, additional to advances in the study of evolutionary development, phenotypic plasticity, evolvability, and systems biology, biology has strained the current framework of a modern evolutionary synthesis. And Added to the central dogma of molecular biology, which is still true, we have to re examine previously dismissed evolutionary mechanisms. In France, it's called Lamarckism. Uh, there are a few others in um, the States, of course, in, in other parts of the world, who say that the evolution is also due to the environmental conditions. So this is a new open field, and I hope this will be interesting for you to understand what happens. And um, thank you very much.
I hope to see you in France. I hope to see you in Indonesia. Please do not hesitate to send me mails. I usually respond, yeah. right, Prof. Sultana? I usually respond yeah. <laughs> and so, and uh, it was really a pleasure to be here, well, to be here, virtually here. And um, I hope um, I make it not too much complicated. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you so uh, much, Prof. Okay, Moko. Okay. Can you uh, uh, switch off the, the PowerPoint presentation oh. so we can see all the students and participants? Yeah. See up. I'm sorry. I, I saw the, you, uh, the PowerPoint. Once again, my uh, um... answer, answer the uh, PowerPoint, so we can see all all the participants easily. Yeah, you can do it. Okay. Uh, uh, not much more than that. <laughs> answer, answer. Oh, okay. That's it. And share, and share, okay. Yeah, so we can see everybody. And Almost. maybe maybe the administrator will take the photo for all of us. Yeah. Sure, and, and send so, it to me. Okay, certainly. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Professor Gerard Moko. It was so great lecture and you are so patient to explain slowly and clear, especially for us who not speak English very well. So we can follow you with the picture, very nice. So thank you so much for your generous time for us. It's almost more than two hours. It's very well, special I'm, lecture for all I, of us, I'm, yeah. Time flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you said see you in Indonesia or see you in France. I think most better see you in Indonesia because well, all the I, participants I here so. cannot, <laughs> cannot, everybody cannot pay the the play, uh, the ticket plane to France. So we invite you to come sometime. Yeah, if everybody want to ask question, uh, please, or you can also send an email to him. That's true. Yeah, uh, because he already share uh, his email address. Uh, thanks, my, my friend. If I, if you allow me to say that, um, was not you who asked to me to do that? I will not have done that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Ibu Sultana and uh, and my wife and uh, his husband, her husband and myself are friends. And um, actually, um, the last tw twelve years, I came, let's say, twenty times to Indonesia. Well, not to Indonesia, to universities in Indonesia. Apart from a trip with you, Sultana, and many Ibu universities. <laughs> but you, I know universities. And we had 16 students from Indonesia coming to Poitiers to get their PhD. And I hope this will follow up after uh, my retirement. I know that uh, several have taken contacts. I guess um, um, people from Umtan. Uh, your um, pupil from uh, Chegebon uh, and so on. Um, I hope uh, the links will be uh, always maintained. I hope the French embassy will be dynamics. Yeah. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Remember, we, we also sent four students uh, from genetic counseling with you oh, for one year each, and three of them got the uh, double degree. So oh, MSC no, and M MCMED, double degree. So from France, one year get the MSC, and then from mm -hmm. Asia get the uh, MSCMED, yeah. 
for very student good. Prof Gerard Moko is very special very and very they learn French language yeah, yeah. that's it that's yeah. a I think very we can important. contact Institute of France Prof, Prof Moko Institute of France at the embassy so they maybe can facilitate us okay good yeah. well, you see any question in... please Right, eh? Nabila, I give to you back. All right. Okay. So if, if there is no question, so I will close. Uh, Alhamdulillah, alamin. Now we reach to the to the end of agenda. Thank you for everyone who participated today, and thank you for Prof Muko for your valuable.